So thank you everybody for your interest in this. Uh, at the end of the year session, which is over, everybody is tired, which is uh, always uh, quite challenging. Um, I'm very pleased for this opportunity to talk about the health workforce and also to introduce uh, the GLORA project. So now I'm trying, um, hmm, interesting. I cannot move forward the presentation. Ah. Can you see the, the next slide? It's, it's working. Okay, yes, perfect. Thank you. So why do I think that the health workforce is important? Uh, besides the fact that this is my research area since many, many, many years. Uh, so uh, I think we all know that with the COVID-19 pandemic, the situation of all healthcare workers has really worsened dramatically. And there is some more attention from policymakers and from professional organizations, hospital managers, and so on. But at the same time, I think there are also a lot of still problems. Uh, and one key issue is that the, the approaches to the health workforce is still even up after all the problems uh, now there's very much a health labor market approach, which is by no means important, but not sufficient. And we often forgot that there is a person behind every healthcare worker. Uh, and we, we call it in the UFA group, the human face um, that we want to make visible. And there are also two other very important things that are both very close to my heart. One is, why do we need a global approach? And here I will introduce the GLORA, uh, a protect project, uh, and uh, explain a little more why I think a global health approach is very important for the health workforce. And that is why I'm especially grateful for this GLORA program, because GLORA is a bit more innovative. You do not only look at classic topics of global health and international health, uh, you also allow for a bit broader approach and uh, bring in the health workforce, for instance, which is not taken for granted, um, to look at from a global wow. health perspective at the health workforce. And the second point, equally important for me, uh, is why we need the feminist approach. Uh, and, and here I would like to take the opportunity and uh, to connect this lecture um, to the awareness uh, week. And I will tell you a little bit more about this in, uh, after I have introduced the GLORA project. So now to protect, protect migrant healthcare workers closing a gap in Germany's pandemic preparedness and global health policy. That is a topic of our project. And it is an interdisciplinary pilot project, which tries to pay greater attention to the social dimensions of the pandemic and, as I already mentioned, the needs of the healthcare workers. The study connects health policy and systems on the one hand and actor centers approaches on the other. Uh, and it especially tries to investigate the perceptions and needs of the health uh, professionals with a focus on higher skilled migrant healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic. And here we have selected the um, doctors uh, from Romania who are working in Germany because this is currently the largest group of doctors, uh, foreign doctors in Germany. With the, with the protect project we are hoping uh, to contribute to improve migrant uh, the protection of migrant health care workers and the pandemic preparedness but we also hope to contribute to more effective health workforce policy which uh, is also more able to apply a european a global approach uh, based on solidarity these are the three collaborating universities, the Hanover Medical School, uh, University of Medicine Göttingen, and our colleagues in uh, Romania, uh, in cluj napoca from Babsboya University. The methods, are, and as Esther already said, uh, there is a, a 
uh, the Glora Academy series also wants to put a focus on the methods and on the interdisciplinarity and the, uh, the, um, the, the, the transnational collaborations. And we have applied a mixed method approach and we have three work packages. The first work package um, is based on survey data from COVID-19 studies that my colleagues at Hanover Medical School have gathered. The second work package is focused on these physicians from Romania. And the third work package uh, by next year is uh, focused on developing policy solutions. So why is interprofessional collaboration important? It maximizes available data and resources, and especially during the pandemic or also after the pandemic in the transition stage, we really need that as, as data are very scarce. So we need to, to use every possible opportunity um, to get new information to improve our knowledge. It supports data sharing, it, it creates also and deepens existing knowledge, and it contributes to evidence-based research that then hopefully can inform policymakers. Now the question, how can that be done? Of course, there are very many different opportunities how this can be done, and I would like to, to tell you a little bit more about what we have done in Work Package 2 in the PROTECT project. And we tried to align clinical studies and survey data uh, from two COVID-19 projects gathered at Hanover Medical School. Therefore, we used secondary analysis. So we had not the opportunity, of course, to, uh, to design these surveys. We had to, uh, to look what is already available, what is available from these large projects, and how uh, then can we use these data for PROTECT. And the first project is called MIFI, that is a long COVID project, a larger project. I, 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 don't, I can't go into details, but at the end of the presentation, uh, which is supposedly available to everybody, there are the links uh, to more information on, on the initial uh, clinical projects. So we had a look at a few selected items, for instance, vaccination, infection, uh, but also, fortunately, my colleagues also used a kind of psychosociological score. And what did we find? Interestingly, I think, and not totally expected in this way, we, we didn't find any significant differences between national and foreign-born healthcare workers for the medical items. And there were also no significant differences in the composition of the samples of the foreign and the national born healthcare workers. But where we saw differences is in this uh, uh, psychosocial score and differences um, that point into the direction of disadvantages of the migrant healthcare workers. I know that is a, it's, it's odd because it's by far too small. I just wanted to highlight this one thing so that uh, um, you see this at the end. Uh, this score is the only one uh, where we see some relevant differences. And we therefore had a closer look at the, at the items combined into this uh, score, and it was possible to, to select the two items that are relevant for us and uh, do um, an in-depth analysis for these items. And these items are social activities and stress. And as you see, both of these items um, are signif have, show significant differences and especially the social activities uh, show strong disadvantages of the migrant healthcare workers. Uh, then the next study or the second study where we have the opportunity for secondary analysis 
is called uh, a COCO uh, Corona Contact Study. Um, this uh, study, my colleagues started that immediately after the pandemic. Um, had, uh, has been declared a pandemic, so uh, they have um, they have follow up data, and we had the opportunity to do at first an analysis for all healthcare workers. So the general sample is around one thousand healthcare workers from Hanover Medical School that had or could have had contact with the corona, with the COVID-19 patients. Then, uh, of course, if you, if you look at the migrant healthcare workers, uh, you have a much, much smaller sample. That is, of course, always the problem. But nevertheless, I think there are interesting examples. And having a look at all healthcare workers at Hanover Medical School, we found that again there is no difference in the medical items there was no difference um, in the uh, in in the actual infection in in, in the medi medical yeah, uh, medical measures so and the infection of the infection rate of hanover medical school healthcare workers during the first and second wave of the pandemic was in the range of uh, of the area of Hanover or Lower Saxony, but interestingly, we had a look at the perceptions. There were quite a lot of items that allowed uh, to measure the the perceptions of the healthcare workers. Uh, for instance, on their fear of infection, uh, stress, and these kind of things, and there. It is a really was was really surprising. Fifteen to twenty times higher uh, than the actual risk was their perception, and that means it's very important because uh, the healthcare, the fear of the healthcare worker uh, was without reason so high, and that means the medical on the medical side, the university hospital did great, but of uh, obviously there must have been problems in really communicating that and in, in yeah being able to understand the needs and the, the, the perceptions of the healthcare workers. I don't go into detail as this is also published, but what was done then that um, my, my colleagues, this is a follow-up study and at the beginning during the first and second wave, it was not asked, there was no differentiation between national born and foreign born healthcare workers. But then um, when we were thinking of applying uh, already for, for Laura, we thought that is interesting. We, we should have a look uh, also at, at the migrant healthcare workers. And then in the follow-up studies that were designed in a little bit different way, it was possible to bring in uh, this, the, this item, national born, foreign born in an EU country other than Germany and foreign born in a non-EU country. And then in, in the fo follow-up uh, survey, uh, which uh, had, had a smaller response rate as usual, um, but it was possible from, from this survey to make connections uh, to the statistics of the first surveys. I uh, don't ask me how, how that uh, worked. It would be too, uh, too complicated, but my colleagues made that possible and put quite a lot of work in this. And now we have a small sample, but we have um, a, a sample uh, that allows us really uh, to compare these three groups, um, and uh, which I think is for, to my knowledge, at least from, from our literature review is the first time uh, for, for Germany that we have the opportunity uh, really to have these uh, perceptions of healthcare workers uh, that we can compare uh, for national and foreign born and also for, for EU and non-EU. Born. The findings, I haven't put the findings in because it's very much uh, in, um, it's in progress. We have 
the findings more or less and uh, the findings say that there is again no difference for all these perceptions of of more uh, yeah of risk and vaccination and all these kind of things um, but uh, I haven't put the data in because it's currently in the process of being uh, validated from uh, from NASA again with the statistics so we it will be available very soon and here are the uh, more information on the on the two studies where we used the secondary data my main conclusion in relation to interdisciplinarity and why I um, I'm hoping that it's interesting to encourage you all, if you want to, to carry out research, um, it's always very difficult and takes a lot of time to find money for this. Um, it, it, uh, if, you, if you find an, uh, um, an opportunity to use existing data to collaborate uh, with your with colleagues, um, and, and use that for secondary analysis or do kind of tandem questions where you put in your questions in their survey, uh, then it is a very, very big advantage. And it, uh, of course, it needs less money um, and you have findings much quicker. Uh, and even uh, with the last study, with the COCO study, where I said, if you have colleagues that are really interested and collaborate and that are uh, that, that are able and willing to put in more uh, more uh, time, uh, then it might even be possible to do these reanalysis and uh, if, if you have a longitudinal studies. So that was my main message on this. It's useful really um, to intensify this interdisciplinary collaboration because you get out things that you would, I would as, as a, a, a public health researcher or sociologist, I would never be able um, to get uh, access to this kind of data. So the next point, the transnational uh, and EU collaboration uh, so if you work with, if you want to do interviews with migrant healthcare workers, especially with doctors who are extremely busy, um, then you need access through, uh, yeah, you, you need kind of door opener. And here our colleague collaboration with the colleagues from the Romanian University from Cluj Napoca was really extremely helpful uh, on the one hand, and they help also to, to develop the, um, the topic guide and to provide background information, but they also uh, make these contacts possible. And even if they didn't, did not do the contacts themselves, we found that it was extremely useful uh, for our interviewers when several said, oh, we saw you are collaborating with Cluj Napocha and, and these kind of things. So if you do, um, if you do research with migrant healthcare workers, it's definitely very, very helpful to build up transnational collaborations and work closely um, with uh, colleagues from the, uh, from the sending country. I can't go into detail uh, in relation to the data here, but just want, want to mention two, uh, one thing. Uh, the, the, the interviews have been carried out now and we, we are doing the analysis and we specifically next to several other things look at the what we call migration pattern to find out who and what kind of pattern might be interesting for developing an EU approach, a solidarity approach, a more transnational um, um, approach to health workforce policy and development. And there we found two patterns, we call it circular migration um, and the, the cosmopolitan and the open door physicians uh, that would be willing to support, supposedly support uh, what is called circular migration approaches. And circular migration approach, that is not our idea. It is uh, since longer, uh, in the discussion, and that means to find uh, health workforce policies 
uh, where both countries or more countries uh, benefit and where we uh, stop this uh, uh, care and brain day, uh, drain and find ways that are more, yeah, more solidarity based, more, more effective for both countries. Uh, and with a cosmopolitan physician, uh, we found a pattern uh, of highly flexible doctors. They are aiming, they clearly said they they came to Germany because they are aiming for the best training. Um, and here they, they find the standard, the medical standards are higher, but also the uh, important issue was that they said the career chances are more fair than in Romania and less corrupt. So they didn't want to be part of a corrupt system. Uh, and they, there was a strong focus on the medical standards and the opportunities to get good training but at the same time it was clear that several of them said but the social environment and how my children grow up and this kind of things is also relevant and the the second important uh, pattern for circular migration is what we call the open future a physician a physician who is very well integrated here, uh, likes it to be here, has built up a family quite often. Uh, but then I say, yes, the, the, the dream to return home is still there, or I kept the door open, or as somebody said, I want to give my country a chance. So this is, um, there is quite a large group that is still trying or would wish for to find an opportunity to build these bridges between the two countries without being forced to leave Germany totally. Uh, the, the, the finance will hopefully be finally available early next year. Uh, I wanted more to focus on the, on the transnational issues and the interdisciplinary issues and want to acknowledge um, the support of, of my, co my colleagues uh, and the funding. And this is my, my last point, uh, which I will be shorter. I hope we still have a little bit of time. Uh, as I already mentioned, I want to use uh, this International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, which begins on 25th of November and runs through International Human Rights Day on 10th of December, so exactly in our period. And I thought that is a nice opportunity to use this lecture also to highlight how important it is to stop gender-based and sexual violence in the health workforce. Because this is an issue that very everybody knows that the health, that, that um, the health workforce is not gender neutral and everybody also knows that violence has strongly increased violence in all areas has increased during the COVID-19 pandemic but still there is kind of silence really uh, and making it the gender-based violence sexual violence issues in the health workforce invisible uh, there's very very little if any um, information on this, and it is not mentioned in the recovery plans, not in the national and not in the EU recovery plans. Um, and there is also very little, if any, research. So that means policy totally ignores uh, these problems. And there is a need for, for action. Of course, there first there is a need for action because we need to stop all kinds of violence. Um, but because that threatens the health and well-being of the individual women, also of some men, and it is very likely that there will be intersectional effects. So, which means that migrant um, healthcare workers, migrant women healthcare workers, are supposedly more vulnerable to sexual violence. To my knowledge, there is not really information on that, uh, how that turned out during the pandemic. Uh, but I think it's important to pay greater attention to this. And it threatens workplace safety, of course. It worsens recruitment and retention of healthcare workers because it uh, 
the 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 women who experience uh, these these sexual violence in their job uh, they of course there is a much higher risk that that they uh, either get ill uh, or that they decide to leave the job because they do not want to accept uh, these these kind of work conditions and and then this will increase the health workforce shortages and finally also weaken the healthcare system. So I think there are many, many reasons why it is very important uh, to take action. And the more it, it is really yeah, no longer acceptable, um, that health policy um, does not talk about that and talk to, totally ignores the problem. And what, what we can do, I think, breaking the silence, improving awareness is a first step always. And as I said, as we are doing now, there's the opportunity to use these awareness days. It's a very small step, but nevertheless, it's something. Uh, and there is also the opportunity to to think of if you do research in that area and, and collect data, then keep in mind what might that have to do with sexual violence in the healthcare workforce and, and think how you can integrate it in your research without necessarily doing a project that only focuses on this area. And enhanced policy dialogue and uh, public uh, debate is very important. And I also would like to mention that there is currently a campaign launched by Women in Global Health, which is called Health2, um, uh, related uh, to the Me Too debate, of course. Um, and in, in this uh, campaign, <clears throat> they are trying to collect stories anonymous, of course, uh, from women who experience sexual violence. Uh, this is a very much a global project, so I have not seen data on Germany, uh, but I think it might be a good opportunity to also uh, make this uh, campaign more visible and contribute to that, sorry. So what to conclude, visioning global health and health workforce research, I think uh, at first we need to develop um, health workforce uh, policy that is based on solidarity and on the needs um, of, of the public, not only in one country. Uh, I think that is health workforce is very much usually nationally oriented. And I think in future, we should also keep in mind that national solutions are no longer sustainable. We should also look at what we are doing, for instance, if we are, uh, if, if we, are, we, we are trying to get healthcare workers from other countries and how we can support these other countries in developing sustainable and resilient healthcare systems. And uh, that means to have, to look at what is called circular migration uh, and ways new approaches to policy to stop um, the care and brain drain, and then to integrate gender sensitive approaches in research uh, and policy to stop all forms of violence. And very finally, I would like to introduce the UFA as workforce research uh, section, as Esther already mentioned that when she introduced uh, me. So everybody is welcome uh, to sign up there and to connect. And uh, UFA also has a group of the young UFAs, the UFA Next, a network of early career researchers. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking very much forward to your questions and comments.